Okay, thank you everyone uh, for joining us. And let's get started. Uh, so firstly, welcome everyone to today's panel on cybersecurity in industrial, uh, sorry, in digital manufacturing and international and commercial perspective. Uh, my name is Dr. Hammond Pierce. Uh, I'm a research assistant professor here at New York University's Tandon Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, and also the NYU Center for Cybersecurity. I'm also going to be the host of this event. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge our sponsors, the National Science Foundation, and also the NYU Center for Cybersecurity, who've made these kinds of events possible. Traditional manufacturing is increasingly being supplanted with new technologies. Factories are becoming smarter and more interconnected, and new manufacturing technologies are increasingly being adopted, such as 3D printing and smart hybrid manufacturing. With these new advances comes new risks, especially within the cybersecurity domain, which is what we're really interested in. In this cybersecurity webinar series, the NYU Center for Cybersecurity is hosting panel discussions with experts from academia and industry. All of our previous events uh, have been recorded and are available on YouTube. And this is actually our third year of doing these panels. So today's panel is actually the 12th panel that we've done overall. Uh, we hope that these panels are an opportunity for everyone to meet with and directly ask questions to some of the leading experts in the field. So today's panel, as I mentioned, is the final panel this, uh, in this year, um, and it has a focus on the international and commercial perspective. We're planning on broadcasting a conversation which covers how research and work undertaken in this domain changes as you look at the different R&D from different academic and commercial perspectives and organizations around the world. We're really fortunate to have three very eminent panelists with us today. I'll briefly introduce them and then each will take over and just take a couple of minutes to uh, talk about their areas. I'd also like to point out that to all of our people in the audience, you can ask questions at any time, including from now, just by using Zoom's Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. So first, firstly on our panel today, we have Dr. Phil Reeves, who's a leading consultant on 3D printing business strategy and investment. Phil has worked in 3D printing for the last 27 years, having gained a PhD in the subject from Nottingham University in the UK in the mid-1990s. Since then, Phil has worked at several 3D printing related roles, including R&D, business development, and corporate strategy. In 2003, Phil founded the leading 3D printing consulting firm, Econolist Limited, which Stratasys acquired in 2015. And between 2015 and 2018, Phil was then vice president of consulting at Stratasys, which is the world's leading 3D printing technology vendor. Phil is now the managing director of Reeves Insight, an advisory firm working with 3D printing technology users, vendors, and investors. Phil is also a non-executive director of 4D Biomaterials, a 2020 spin out from the University of Birmingham. 4D biomaterials are commercializing a new type of bioreabsorbable, photocurable 3D printing resin. Secondly, we have Shuchi SK Karana, the founder and CEO of Adiguru. SK has more than 20 years of experience in advanced manufacturing and has managed government projects and programs totaling more than $2.5 million. He has a Master of Business Administration and Master of Science in Materials Science and Engineering, both from The Ohio State University and a Bachelor of Technology in Materials and Metallurgical Engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology. Prior to founding Adiguru, SK worked at Intralox, where he led the development and launch of a predictive software product for industrial use, which had more than 600 users. At his former employer, EWI, he commercialized weld prediction software, EWI Weld Predictor, and a virtual welding trainer commercial product, which was successfully acquired by a large manufacturer in the welding industry. SK has also previously co-founded a medical device startup with a goal of social impact and raised $4 million in venture funding for the company and took the company to clinical trial stage. He also also written a number of publications and holds eight patents. Finally, we have Thomas de Boysen, senior associate at the international law firm CMS based in Brussels, the heart of Europe. Thomas specializes in data protection and the GDPR and privacy, intellectual property rights, technology, and cybersecurity. For almost a decade, he has been guiding clients on complex issues spanning data protection, cyber, consumer protection, and online e-privacy. His practice covers a wide range of advisory, transactional, and litigation work in diverse industry sectors, from technology and life sciences to energy, consumer products, and the media sector. Thomas is an active member of several professional associations, such as the IAPP and AIPPI. He has written numerous publications in the field of intellectual property and data protection for law journals, such as the European Data Protection Law Review. 
I'm really pleased to welcome our panelists. And now I'm going to request each panelist to just take a few minutes to give an overview of their work. And just as a reminder, if you are in the audience, please ask questions using Zoom's Q&A utilities. Uh, we will take some of the questions as soon as we get them. So we'll start with Phil. Hey, Hammond, thank you. And, and thanks for the, the kind introduction. So uh, as Hammond has, has uh, very eloquently uh, provided some of the, my background over the last 30 years or so in 3D printing, I think to put into context why I'm part of this panel today, for the last 10 years or so, I've been involved in a number of different projects, uh, certainly here in the UK with our patent office and with the European patent office, uh, looking at the emerging implications of 3D printing technology around patent infringement, copyright infringement, trademark infringement, um, and really looking at whether the leg legislative and regulatory frameworks are correct. Um, and more recently, my interests are, are really around data security as opposed to IP infringement. And that's largely driven off the use of 3D printing for much higher value critical component manufacturing in both aerospace and medical device manufacture, uh, where we're now starting to consider uh, the security of data transfer, the corruption of data transfer, the creation of digital twins, um, and, and how data becomes an integral part of product certification. Um, and largely uh, the lack of infrastructure from the 3D printing hardware vendors, but we'll, we'll get onto that later on. So I think that, that sets the scene for why I'm, I'm interested in the debate that we're going to have today. Thanks so much, Phil. Okay, next we have Thomas. Thank you, Hemmings, and thank you for the introduction. Um, good afternoon in Brussels, the afternoon, everyone. Um, so yes, I'm senior associate at CMS, a law firm based in Brussels. Um, my background is uh, mostly in, in data protection, cybersecurity. So the reason why I joined this panel is just to give uh, my view and the view, obviously, that I get from my clients regarding the cyber risk around uh, 3D printing, but also cyber risk in general that we can perhaps replicate with uh, any companies, in fact, because as we know, 3D printing at, are at the end of the day uh, a printer and just connected to the internet. Um, and so I'll be happy to share my insight on any cyber risk I may help the audience, but also um, yeah, the future related to, to 3D printing, sorry. Great, thank you so much, Thomas. Uh, and lastly, we have SK. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me here. I'm uh, excited to be here. Uh, and thanks for the kind introduction as well. Mm, so yeah, my background is uh, has a lot has been in manufacturing throughout my career uh, with the with focus on materials and, and predictive analysis. Uh, about 12 years ago, I founded, a, you know, I, actually before that I was working in a company where welding was a focus and, and welding and joining is actually one of the steps towards additive manufacturing, right? So additive manufacturing or 3D printing has become very popular in the last 12, 12 years or so. And, uh, and, and it's, it's basically a layer by layer process. So what we do uh, at Adiguru is actually what we do is we provide in-situ monitoring technology or real-time monitoring technology for additive manufacturing processes using artificial intelligence and machine learning. And the way we work with is we integrate with machines and, uh, and then integrate the technology with them uh, rather than creating our own very standalone process or just standalone software. Uh, we obviously use this by combination of material science, computer vision, artificial intelligence, and in the future we'll be involving physics-based modeling and thing, other, other aspects as well. So, so yeah, uh, excited to be here. Would love to share my thoughts. I'm not an expert in cybersecurity, but uh, I think I, I have some opinions. I can definitely share those here. Great. Thank you so much, Eska. So, that's it for the panelists, so thank you so much. And um, what we're going to do now is proceed to the next part of the panel where we are going to take questions from the audience and we've got a, a couple of questions in reserve ourselves. Um, so this is your chance as an audience to ask questions of these experts. Um, please do so using the, the Zoom Q&A feature and um, we're really excited to get started. Um, so for the first question, I'm actually gonna kind of pose this to all of you because it's a, it's a pretty uh, open-ended one. Um, but it really just comes down to what the differences are between, say, 
protecting a traditional manufacturing enterprise versus these new additive manufacturing and, and even just new digital manufacturing you know we, we're connecting old equipment to the internet we're updating things so that they have more computing power within them so do you think that there are differences in how people should be approaching this from the, the view of you know ensuring that their business will, will always be able to function the way they want it to versus how maybe people approach this 20 years ago 30 years ago um, so I'm happy for anyone to, to take that question. Sure, I, I guess I, I could jump in from a from a, a th what we've seen in the world of 3D printing, which is replacing or, or certainly augmenting traditional manufacturing. And I think the big difference now is the ability to rapidly change the supply chain. If I think back to sort of traditional subtractive manufacturing where tooling's required or where mold tools are required, you you go out to sort of traditional tender process, you find a supplier and you lock yourself to that supplier, typically for the life of that product. And you expect the supplier to, to find some iterative cost down every year. Uh, that's not really how the, the supply chain necessarily works with 3D printing. You know, the benefit of digitally enabled manufacturers is the ability to jump from supplier to supplier. So whether that's because of cost, whether it's resilience because shipping issues or, or, or you know, all the global issues we've seen around the pandemic. Um, and quite often contract negotiation takes so long between two companies that it negates the benefit of using digital manufacturing. So I think that's part of the change that's going on is companies' procurement departments are having to change the way they operate. They're having to change the way they think about approving a supplier, onboarding a supplier, doing due diligence on that supplier, because traditionally those things take months. But I can fire my files around the world and find new suppliers in minutes. So I think that's, that's part of the, the, the system that's changing. And I think for that to work, you have to have robust and resilient IT infrastructure behind that. And you have to have trust in the way that those files are moving around. And I think that's the bit that's missing is mm -hmm. that that trust doesn't exist. So people are just falling back onto the traditional, we do our due diligence on three suppliers, we get quotes from three suppliers, we onboard them as potential suppliers, and then we might use them at some point in the future. So, so I think it's not... It's maybe not a technological barrier at the moment. I think it's more of a cultural and a legal barrier that prevents us really exploiting truly distributed digital manufacture. Thanks, um, Phil. Uh, uh, SK, coming in as a, you know, a potential uh, industry person in this space, um, how do you, do you agree with that? Do you think that, because uh, you're, you're essentially going to be functioning a little bit as a, a vendor for other vendors, if I understand correctly. Yeah, so the way we are uh, positioned is we we are neither a machine manufacturer nor we are a part maker. We are uh, positioned as as a as a company as a third party company that can help with uh, with getting you the idea that there, everything in the build went okay. What we say right now is uh, and and using low cost sensors and practical sensors, practical and affordable, I should say. Uh, rather than very expensive sensors, we are not replacing quality control uh, or any any quality um, scans after uh, you know CT scans or anything that you do or a part maker should do. But what we are saying is we can reduce cost because this is a digital process, but still maturing. And in polymer, it's very advanced, but still the costs are high, right? If you use and and but but not going into that, uh, you can significantly reduce cost by by knowing what's going on in the part, and that's what we do. We we, we give granular information as what's going on in the power part, and if something went wrong or not, right? So if something went wrong, it'll be available, and that's where it can help the supply chain as well. I th I think uh, what Philip mentioned earlier is that people are not adopting this or are not adopting multiple suppliers because of that, but also they're not adopting because they're not sure uh, whether the, this manufacturer will be able to give them a good part, just like in machining. So they just want to go to the another one. And, and then that leads to, you know, you want them to compete and the more competition, the better the part, better the quality and lower the price or lower the cost, right? Which helps everyone in the long run. Um, and that's where something like what we are doing could help uh, in terms of providing more uh, consistency across 
that okay there is a there's a third party system that can you know you make a like a part on a statistics machine or or some other machine it will you'll get same same quality part as well right so that's important from the cybersecurity standpoint frankly the industry with the way i see it as industry is very new and you know as compared to other manufacturing right which has been going on for centuries or even older right so so people are still adopting it uh, and then obviously higher value areas is easier to adopt for example prototyping is great right 12, 12 years ago prototyping was going was the key here but now we are getting to the cusp of getting into low volume production and then maybe high volume production using uh, 3d printing as well but uh, but with prototyping you would just make prototypes so you didn't need any monitoring you didn't care for you know a lot of security as well but then high volume production is where you want print you know if you give a file to print farm you don't want that to be leaked yes. <laughs> as such right but then that happens the same with the with like if you have a uh, you have a design of a part and you give it to a mold mold manufacturer in taiwan or in china and you don't want that design to be leaked as well so how do you protect yourself i th- i think uh, I, additive manufacturing being a digital process actually gives you more ways to protect it as compared to other processes. Okay, thanks. Um, Thomas, both uh, both Phil and uh, SK mentioned legal aspects to the, this new form of technology. Um, what are your thoughts on on how you know this new type of manufacturing uh, uh, is interacting with the legal world? Well, I think, um, and as Philip mentioned, uh, the trust of the, file mo- the files moving around is, is an important point to, to, to take into account on the legal side um, and finding ways to, to protect them to avoid, as was the case with the music industry, uh, a big piracy, pri- uh, piracy around the music uh, as it was before. You could have the same here. And so you can, uh, yeah, lose the trust in it, lose the trust in the system. Um, so it's not it's not an easy task. I mean, counterfeiting it's a, it's a major problem. Uh, it's hard to fight. Uh, it, in certain way, it will always be there. Uh, so you have to, to cope with it uh, and to to limit as, as much as possible. For instance, via some security measures uh, and some you know whatever you can do to to protect your your three D printers and to protect the file. But it's, it's not an easy task, even on the legal side. Uh, I don't say that I have a, um, a magic formula here, but um, it's, uh, it's something to take into account by companies. They know it. Um, they can more or less protect themselves via contracts, agreements. But obviously, at the end of the day, uh, if the files move around and, and it's on a, a piracy platforms, it's really hard to, uh, to take them down, as it was with the, with the music industry. So we will need, I guess, enterprise will need to adapt um, and I would say f- more fa- faster than, than expected as was with the music industry. Great, thank you. Um, I've got a question from the audience. Um, this one's probably for you, Phil. Uh, can you comment on biomaterials and how this is having some commercial um, uh, aspect through additive manufacturing? Yeah, sure. I mean, obviously, uh, m- the medical domain is probably the largest commercial or, or certainly volume user of 3D printing now. Um, you know, for, for the last 15 years, we've been making millions of hearing aids every year by 3D printing. We're now making hundreds of thousands of orthopedic implants by 3D printing, traditionally using materials like titanium and home. We saw established uh, materials for, for implantology. We're now starting to see um, a range of new materials emerging that are specific to 3D printing for implant manufacture. Um, so the, the, the company that I work with, 4D Biomaterials, um, that's about 15 years of academic research to develop a completely new type of polymer that's benign in the human body that breaks down into water and naturally occurring alcohol. Um, the only way you can process it is through photocurable means. So that could be photo, uh, casting, sheet manufacture under UV, but fundamentally it's designed to be 3D printed. So, you know, that's sort of the early stage of biomaterials. We're starting to see 
printing with cell loaded materials now there are a number of extrusion based 3d printing technologies that allow us to seed scaffolds with stem cells and with other uh, other cell types and tissues um, and and it's showing some real promise i mean certainly within the last i suppose two months we've seen work coming out of cornell university for the first 3d printed genuinely 3d printed ear that's been put back onto a patient using their own stem cells so yeah, it's maturing at, at a good rate of knots, but there's like anything, you know, a significant number of, of regulatory considerations and commercial considerations to, to overcome. And of course that then moves into the, into the cyber issue of, of transfer of data and how we're ensuring that we have the right data, particularly if it's patient specific, because you've, you've in essence got two directions of data transfer. You've got scanning from patient, whether that's CT, MRI, contact laser uh, sorry non-contact laser then the manipulation of that data putting that data through some sort of post pre-processing printing it getting that part back to the customer or the patient should i say so so you actually have a very complex flow of, of information which then falls into all sorts of issues about patient confidentiality of data uh, gdpr over here in europe who has access to what information from that data so it is certainly maturing at a rate of knots and i would say in terms of bioprinting and, and, and medical printing in general, the technology is probably further along than the, the commercial pathway and the legislation that needs to sit behind it. Okay, that, yeah, and, and you mentioned the, the, the legal aspect already, but yeah, I, the, I imagine that anytime you've got anything like medical data or patient data, it has a higher level of care required to protect that data than uh, you know, traditional manufacturing data. It, it does, but but to some degree, the infrastructure is already in place for that. And, and for many years, they've been, you know, well, I wouldn't say very, you know, nothing is, 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 is totally secure, but they've been, you know, very high levels of encrypted data transfer within the medical sector. Um, and there are protocols for stripping out patient information. Uh, the, the, the worry is more about, well, what happens if that data is, is somehow corrupted and manipulated? You know, if I'm printing a, a, a mandible, um, reconstructive mandible implant, um, whoever prints it, they're going to look at it and they're not going to know whether the geometry is right or not because they, they have no frame of reference. So, so if I maliciously or, or inadvertently corrupt that data file and it prints incorrectly, um, nobody would ever know until it gets back in the hands of the surgeon and, and he discovers it doesn't fit. So, so I think it's, there's, there's, some, there's some plus sides of working in the medical sector in terms of the, the way that data is exchanged, but the level of complexity of making bespoke patient specific devices by 3d printing is yeah it's it's a challenge but lots and lots of companies are doing it don't get me wrong there's mm. yeah the millions of patient specific 3d printed devices out there now okay that, that's that's really interesting thanks um sk we have a question from for you from the audience um your platform uh, you mentioned is based on machine learning when obviously we're hearing a lot of, about these days about machine learning. Are you able to comment on how it's able to do things in manufacturing that other existing technologies aren't? You know, why are you using machine learning versus other kinds of technology? Uh, so, so what we are doing is uh, you can go to our website and see a little bit more detail and um, not to take too much of time here, uh, but what we are doing here is using affordable and practical sensors. And the first and foremost affordable sensor is actually is an optical camera. Uh, you can use a high resolution optical camera or even sometimes a low resolution optical camera. So, uh, so we created, a, we are using optical cameras to detect issues in this. We, we take pictures layer by layer of the process and then using uh, computer vision, artificial intelligence, which is convolutional neural networks in this case, use those algorithms to detect if something else is, something is going wrong in that process. And obviously different AM pro additive manufacturing processes have different uh, issues, but as a platform software, it helps us, uh, it helps us get to different uh, processes or monitor different processes at far more ref greater efficiency then maybe uh, companies or uh, technologies focused on just one process. Um, that being said, that is a starting point for us. And then in future, we, uh, we will be adding more machine data based machine learning and artificial intelligence tools to detect anomalies uh, and defects. 
as uh, and then um, we'll be adding other low, you know, affordable sensors. We are not looking at you know three hundred thousand dollar infrared sensor, but maybe could we use a you know four or five thousand dollar infrared sensor for a printer which is you know half a million dollar printer. But if you are looking at a ten thousand dollar printer or five thousand dollar printer, then we would be you know try to use uh, you know low cost sensor that makes sense for that printer. That's the that's the idea. Uh, yeah. So I suppose. The, the answer there is that you're doing things with cameras that there aren't really non machine learning equivalents for. Right, right. So yeah, you know, for that, you, you it's people think that you can use uh, competitive layer data from the previous builds to to compare visually, but no, that's that's very difficult actually using just pure computer vision algorithms. It's actually pretty much impossible because First of all, one build is not exactly same as the next build, even it's the same part, same printer, everything the same, it's still different. And then there is slight variation in the height, slight variation in the light, uh, and so many other things, which it's better to use convolutional neural networks along with computer vision techniques to get a good accurate detection of issues. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I, I guess that technique could also be leveraged to find things like defects that have been, because I suppose there's not too much difference from an accidental defect versus a maliciously placed defect. So perhaps a, uh, your vision algorithms could detect that. Yeah, so the vision algorithm can tell you there's an issue and, and uh, it could come because somebody maliciously tampered with the files and did something, or somebody could uh, also, you know, it just happened, right? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, so if it just happened and you print again and it happens again, that's another way to flag, okay, it's a similar thing happening again. So something's wrong with your files. Mm -hmm. Now it mm -hmm. happened because the file was tampered or file was corrupted. Uh, uh, you can develop further algorithms on top of that um, to detect it. Another thing is machine data, right? Now machine, let's say we can pick a process uh, rather than, that's the, another thing is additive manufacturing is a big term um, but those who know additive manufacturing, you know, it's, there's a polymer, within polymer, there is different processes, there's metals and within metals, there's different processes. So we can pick one process, which is known as FPM or FFF or extrusion based process. And in extrusion based process, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the way you can put a camera or, or, or let's talk about machine data, right? The way you can get the other machine data is like the current of the extruder, the bed height, um what else uh you know the, the bed temperature the uh, filament feed rate um and things like that so those can be monitored right uh, some machines do output that uh, and then you can use that and use your machine learning algorithms to detect what's going wrong right or what's out of the nominal and again same thing if is it because of somebody tampered with it or somebody not Frankly, right now, people are, uh, there are two aspects going on in the industry in general, when it's high value parts, when you're printing high value parts, nobody is connecting a machine to the internet. So nobody is doing that. I don't know even one customer does that. And, and we provide a software. It can be, you know, ideally in, in the world, you know, you would, everybody would think it's a online based software, but actually it's not. We, have an edge-based software, which means it runs locally next to the machine and can run without any internet connection. The only reason it needs internet connection is to send an email notification. Uh, but, but if you are worried about that, it can run without any internet connection. And the reason we did that was all our customers are worried about that. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. don't want any internet connection because they're worried about cybersecurity and they're worried about overall, um, you know, like one is, you know, somebody will can come and steal their parts and and also they're doing a lot of very sensitive work for space, space and defense sectors because that is one of the biggest adopters right now of AM processes. So, so yeah, you know, very few printers are connected to the internet because they're worried about cybersecurity. But if, mm -hmm. if there is a solution out there which makes them all secure in a way, that could be a big uh, advantage for the whole industry. Okay, thanks. Um, Thomas, we've got a question for you. Um, so 
IP and intellectual property laws in different countries tend to be quite different to one another, um, but the globally distributed uh, nature of manufacturing and especially additive manufacturing, as Phil mentioned, you know, we've got different suppliers and we can choose different countries almost at will, um, can make it, uh, I assume there's a, a, a certain difficulty in enforcing protection of your intellectual property. Um, have you seen any legislation or, you know, what are the, what are the ways that the that companies are trying to approach this challenge of, of protecting their IP cross borders? Uh, that's a good question. Um, indeed, it's, uh, well, for some of the intellectual property rights, uh, for instance, if you take trademarks, um, at least in Europe, you have, um, you can have a European trademark so that, that could be protected in various country. Uh, but obviously you can also do it locally if you want, any, if you, you're targeting a smaller market. Um, but indeed, it's a, it's a challenge, especially if you you want to protect uh, in the biggest market in Europe. I'm just talking here about Europe. Um, if you want to go or in all the UK, well, you have to apply in different different laws and different legislation, and that's a matter of compliance. Basically, you need to choose your market, to choose what, what where you want to go, what's what would be the customers, and then you can look at the at the laws. I would say that in intellectual property, uh, we could say in a broad sense that more or less you have the criteria are more or less the same uh, all around Europe, and it's uh, in a, in a broad sense I would say, uh, and you could choose um, so uh, and you can more or less choose your protection around Europe uh, easily, I mean easily, uh, so to speak. Um, but indeed, it's uh, as with every every technology, you, you need to to tackle these uh, compliance issues. And, and I know it might take time and perhaps feel it as a experience with that. Um, but it's one thing you need to do, a tick the box exercise, uh, to, depending on the market where you want to enter. Yeah, um, actually, I, I would like to build on that with um, Philip a little bit um, regarding to the this, this same sort of topic. You mentioned earlier uh, the idea that we needed to come up with ways to, to trust people and evaluate people by, uh, and organizations based on trust. Um, what's some of the ways that you would advise approaching that problem, Phil? Uh, how can you confirm that a supplier is not going to, you know, how, how can you trust a supplier to not make changes to your design files, as it were? Yeah, I mean, well, I, I suppose in, 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 a, in a most sensible way, you look at the provenance of that supplier, you look at the history of that supplier, and if you're in aerospace, and they've been in aerospace for 70 years, uh, and there's no black marks against their name, then I, I think you, you take that approach. What we are seeing, and just to, to sort of make sure everyone's aware, there are a, a myriad of different uh, solutions emerging for secure data transfer within 3D printing. And what they require is both parties at either end, either node, if you like, to have the same secure software and need to have bought into the same provider. It's almost, it's almost like you know, two, two parties want to trans, uh, trans, transmit data between each other. They both need to be a Cisco user or whatever. So we have companies like Vaxis Orca, Leo Lane, Secure 3D, 3D Connect, who, who have solutions that you can buy into as two parties to transfer data um, where the party who is printing never actually gets the design data. All they ever have is a snapshot of the print data. But that requires the person who is who's authorizing the print to actually have prepared the build file for that person. So, so you end up with a situation that, again, to, 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 to SK's point earlier, very few 3D printers are connected to the internet. That doesn't mean they're not connected to intranets. Most are connected to intranets. And they sit behind a firewall being fed by. Now, the, the thing to consider is that if I have a design, that design has intellectual property in it through, through, through copyright. I might have some patent protection in the design of that, that, that device. I send that design data to somebody to 3D print it. They then have to prepare it for 3D printing. The file I send them is not the file they use. So I need to ensure that my file to them has not got corrupted. When they interpret that file, orientate it, support structure, slice it, that doesn't get corrupted. And then when it goes internally within their business, it doesn't get corrupted. So, so that's, if you like, that's the complexity of the supply chain. And we are starting to see some, some really very slick, secure transfer protocols emerging right the way down to um, certainly the guys at VO in France, they're embedding their firmware into the 3D printers. 
from, the, from a sort of a security by design approach. So some of the next generation of, of hardware is going to have embedded security by design in the chip. So we're going we're gonna to surpass all of this pre-processing of data and send data directly through the internet to the printer. And the person that owns the printer won't ever see that data. They have no access to that data. They don't want access to that data. All they want to do is provide machine capacity. So, so we, are, we are kind of getting to that, that yeah. stage of, of complexity. There, there is a, another part to it, right? Sending and utilizing a printer somewhere else is then, then it's, uh, that, that has its advantages, but also there is a disadvantage. And generally these so-called service bureaus or the small companies, which are equivalent to machine shops, exist, which, exist, which make these uh, parts is because they have also the knowledge about the printing process, about what design would work, how the design would be changed. So a lot of these, at least right now, especially on the metal side, uh, uh, it's a lot of, you know, a lot of companies I've talked to who print parts, they get design. And then they actually, as part of the coding process, they tell them that what changes in the design have to be made to be actually printable because the, customer or the person asking for the print to be printed initially you know it's not like ideally designed for that process so that's an iterative process for them and uh, that actually is quite time consuming and, uh, and in a way an indirect expense right for a printing company so so yeah that that leads to this this aspect of you know if you just secure your design then how will they help you right uh, uh, and the other aspect, which the scenario which Philip just talked about is possible and is going to happen. And that's where the print farms are going to come into play. And that'll be like the, that'll become equivalent of Amazon Web Services, right? If, if I have to print a part and I'm just sending it to a machine directly, then one, I'll first consider, do I have enough production capability to just own the printer, right? Why would I want somebody else to own the printer? If somebody else owns the printer, then what is the advantage of them owning one or two printers, right? Then they need to own up lots of printers to get into economies of scale. So all they're doing is maintaining the printers. They're not doing anything. They're maintaining it. They're adding raw material, things like that. So similar to Amazon Web Services, what Amazon Web Services gives us or AWS gives us is, is actually a you know cloud space which we can use as as we want it right so so are we are we eventually going to move to that model if we are then yes even the security of files becomes even more important yes so i suppose then we would end up with uh, a kind of drm solution for our uh, and I, I guess that's what you were talking about with with, with Raul, phil with you know yeah. the embedded firmware that can because that you know uh, to, to, to take a parallel that's not in manufacturing, uh, when I listen to music on Spotify, Spotify prevents me from saving that music to my computer, right? I can only listen to it, I can't keep it. Uh, and I suppose that there'll be a parallel like that with 3D printing where the, the, the printer itself locks the design file so I can't extract it, but I can still print it and then you know whatever yep. happens to the DRM after that. Yeah, and, and the, 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 some of the systems now are mature enough that if the print fails, the system knows the print's failed. If you try and force the print to fail just at the end, it knows you forced the print to fail. Um, so th the other part of this is, is okay, if, if, you're, you know, if you're talking about sort of FDM, FFF extrusion type technologies, relatively low tech, um, a lot of things that come off those machines are in their final state. They get shipped to the customer, everybody's happy. Certainly in the metal side of, of industrial 3D printing, industrial additive manufacturing, a large percentage of things that come off the machines are not finished. They need post-process machining. They need heat treatment, thermal processes, grind. There's a lot of things that have to happen to them. And you, you know, that's actually where most of the failures are going to come from, not the 3D printing. So, so again, if you're, going to, if you're going to try and have a sort of secure transaction, you've got to think about all those secondary processes as well. Because, you know, if I want to make an aircraft fall out the sky, uh, I'd probably be better hacking the furnace and affecting the heat treatment cycle than I would actually affecting the 3D printed part. Because I can, I, I can certainly initiate failure in a metal component by, by screwing up the heat treatment far more than I can by trying to change the laser parameters. Mm -hmm. so, so I think if, you know, if, we're, if we're truly worried about, about the flow of data, it has to be to the printer and beyond. It's the entire supply chain.
<laughs> and that, that's really interesting. Um, Thomas, uh, you mentioned earlier uh, 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 counterfeiting and how it's not an easy problem to solve. And we've got an audience member that wants to follow up on that. So uh, the question is, COVID has helped to increase e-commerce and the general lack of awareness by consumers when online shopping can lead to the distribution of fake parts. Uh, what do you think needs to be done in this area, maybe in the next decade, to try and address the issue of counterfeiting? Or is it an unsolvable problem? Hmm. Well, it's, I think it's, it, well, it, I don't like to say it, but I think it's an unsolvable problem, to be honest. I think there is, there will always be counterfeiting products, like there will always be hackers um, and computer and, well, cybersecurity issues. So I, I don't think there will, be, there will be one solution that will fit for all um, the industry. And so I think it's something, something you, you need to live with it. As you know, as every company needs to live with the, the fact that one day uh, the company might be hacked and will be hacked. So um, I think it's more or less this, yeah, the same idea that uh, you know that hackers are getting smarter, smarter every day, and they all need to be right once. Well, um, yeah, counterfeit is a, counterfeiting is an issue that's that's there for for a long time and will still be there. But you need you know to be try to be smarter than the yeah the, the, the markets and the black markets. Um, but yeah, I don't think it will, it will disappear, to be honest, unfortunately. Okay. Um, no, perhaps. I, I, just, I, I'm, oh, I'm, go on. Go I, I, I'm going to challenge that because there's some guys not too far down, down the island from you um, in Midtown called Smart Part Hammond. Yeah. They, they have a nano particular additive for, for, for both polymeric and metal additive where, in essence, it becomes your barcode. And you put that material in. It can be anything up to, I think it's one part per 10 million. Um, and you can then trace it, and, and using a using a scanner, light scanner. It, 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 I'm not going to go into the details because it's incredibly complex physics, but you can tell whether that 3D printed part is authentic or fake. But you need the scanner at the other end, and you you need the, you, yeah, you need a contract with them. You need the input material. You need to blend it with your raw material stock. Mm -hmm. um, but in industrial supply chains, that's what people are doing. So. You know, down the line, if you're buying a if you're buying a replacement aircraft component to go inside a 737, I want to know that it was made by Boeing or one of their approved suppliers. Uh, so if I'm Lufthansa, I'm quite prepared to have one of those scanners scan that part and look at whether it's authentic. So I so, suppose I suppose there it's uh, we can prove providence of the, of parts with that in it, but that doesn't yeah. necessarily stop someone counterfeiting it, which no, I suppose no. is the angle that Thomas is coming from to to yeah. say that you know someone might still copy it. I, I, I guess you'll end up with a, a kind of potential gray market for fake components. I suppose that's the risk. But, but, but you have to consider which industry you're in because we have a gray market in Europe. Certainly, you know, the European Union makes a very open point of there is a legalized gray market for spare parts for things like washing machines and cars. You can't close that down. So, mm -hmm. so the idea that you know, if, if a 3D printed part on a car has been designed by the OEM, but then somebody else comes in and makes a copy of it, uh, they may not actually be breaking any laws whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's and that's also a really interesting point. Um, I actually want to build on one of your previous points, Thomas, with regards to, you mentioned that um, cyber incidences are something that companies need to prepare for. Um, what are some of the, you know, what is a potential cyber incidence that a company might want to prepare for from a legal point of view? And, and what are some of the steps they should be, you know, what should they be looking out for? Well, there's a lot, lot of work to do, uh, to be honest, to be prepared for that. Um, and well, we, we saw a spike during the, the pandemic. It was, it was really creating, let's say, insane. The number of, um, of attacks we, we had to, to help a client with. Um, but um, yeah, I would say the first point, obviously, it's to have an, a cybersecurity team, an IT team in place. That looks like a, a silly comment, but... Uh, you might be surprised that some companies just don't have that, or at least they don't outsource it. Um, so it's an important point. And I would say education is a key aspect. Uh, we saw a lot of um, social engineering attacks. So, you know, targeting uh, new employees or um, the head of uh, whatever department, but, you know, just knowing who, who they're going to attack and, you know, sometimes people are just not aware of the attacks and the, the type of uh, of techniques that hackers are using. But once you're aware, you could be more or less more prepared because, as I said, these guys like are smarter every day, or at least 
uh, they use smarter techniques to, 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 to hack the, the companies. Um, so there is not really a, a blue book that you can follow or checklist, but I would say at least you have good cybersecurity defense in place, uh, training your employee, that, that's definitely a must have at least once, twice a year um, to put in place you know, uh, basic cyber hygiene uh, stuff that you can have a multi-factor authentication, um, you know, patching the software, et cetera. That's, uh, we saw a lot of, uh, you know, simple, when you ask the company, your clients, so what kind of techniques you have in place? Uh, sometimes you will be surprised to say that they don't have any basic stuff. Um, and unfortunately, they start to implement serious uh, techniques once it's too late and they say, yeah, now we're going to do it, but you know, the, the, the damage is already done. Um, so yeah. And one last point that we, we saw lots, I mean, at least, uh, in the, in, in Europe, uh, having cyber insurance, um, it obviously doesn't cover everything, but it could at least limit some of the damage that you, you may, you may have, or, uh, that may be covered by the insurance. Great. Thank you. Um, I can't remember uh, who was talking about post-processing. I think it might've been you, Phil. Um, there's a question about post-processing here. If post-processing is mostly mechanical systems, why can't this be done in-house with a minimal security risk? Um, and is there greater risk by exposing your post-processing to some third party? That's a, that is a really good question. I think it depends on what the post-processing is. I think if it's um, you know, light peening the surface or putting it through a vibratory polishing or tumbling, then yeah, that can be done in house or it can be done by your, by the, by the third party bureau. Um, I think it's when it becomes more mission critical, high value. If it's CNC machining, uh, companies that typically outsource their 3D printing, um, unless they're specialists in CNC machining, probably won't have the capacity or capability to do that machining in house either. So they're going to outsource the machining. Certainly heat treatment, that is a specialism and it requires a, a, a you know, very large capital expenditure and skill base. So if you're, you know, if you're making orthopedic hip implants or you're making aerospace components or automotive components, there aren't many companies in the world that actually offer heat treatment that's certified to an ISO standard. You're going to go to a company like Bodycoat to do it um, because they will provide all the documentation, certification, test data that you need if you're in a, a controlled supply chain. So that I think is why people wouldn't do it in-house. Yeah, if I may add to that is, is just, it depends on how many parts you make. Uh, it could be any process, right? It could even be an FDM process. And even if you need a little bit of uh, post-processing there and you're just making a you know, few parts a month, you don't want to bring that capability in. It doesn't make you know, financial and technical sense, right? So you just, uh, that's where you want other companies to do that for you. Uh, if if it's the volume is large, then it'll make financial sense for you to have it in-house anyways, right? Mm -hmm. So so it just depends on what's your, uh, what, 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 what volume you have and what more makes financial sense. And, and yeah, Phil said it correctly, like uh, sometimes technical expertise is needed, then you need backup mm -hmm. people to run it. You need certifications. You need proper facilities. Uh, for example, uh, just making a laser powder, you know, installing a laser powder with fusion printer is not, you can put it in your garage and it's all good. You know, it has to have appropriate um, kind of electrical, vibrational and other things um, done there. And then similarly, like if, and then you, you know, so, I think I'm I'm going to repeat start repeating words. <laughs> yeah, actually, I want to I want to build on your answer there because there's a there's another question here which fits really nicely in here. Um, so as you mentioned, you're you know you can collect quite a lot of data during process, you know, both printing and post processing. Um, how do you ensure that you can uh, analyze that data efficiently, uh, and then also can you use it to determine why a certain defect might be happening? For instance, if you you know if you observe a crack, is it because there's a low laser power, or is it because there's bad powder quality, or, or something along those lines? Uh, this is a very very broad question uh, and very very narrow question at the same time. So efficiency is a very very subjective term, right? Uh, how, what do you do? How do you find efficiency for if you are an academic researcher, yours, and you, you are probably saying, oh, I want to get a huge amount of data and I want to do it and I want to analyze it. But 
we are doing it at the end of the build after one year, you just bring, you know, you're trying to understand what happened in the process, right? So you, you, somebody might write a PhD thesis on that. However, if you are a part maker and you have to send a part at a certain time, a deadline, a good part and get paid, then you want to know what's going on in your part and be able to show some kind of quality certificate. So that's where you want to know what's happening in the, in the process, but you don't want to also pay an arm and a leg for that, right? So, so these are the different aspects that are competing. So yeah, machines can generate a lot of data. You can put, a, there are multiple sensors that can generate terabytes of data, but do they analyze it properly? No, uh, it's, it takes a long time to analyze. It takes a lot of money and uh, effort to store them. What we are going after at Adiguru, we have realized that. Uh, so you have to be very eff like efficient. Uh, it depends on whoever asked the question, what do they mean by efficiency? But for us, efficiency is, and the beauty of this process, it's a layer by layer process. So being a layer by layer process, can we look at each and every layer and determine what happened, you know, if there was an issue in that layer and notify a user. Um, and maybe, maybe send a signal to a machine to do something like pause or something. Uh, but, but for us, efficiency is layer by layer and we are doing it. And yes, that can be done. And if, if the se sensors are, for us, if a sensor cannot be analyzed within that layer or very quickly um, for that layer data, then that is not an, for us, that's not a, a practical sensor. Great, thanks. Um, I've got a question here for Philip, um, which is uh, there are shape changing behaviors exhibited by uh, additive manufacturing prints um, and what is causing these properties during, you know, a change during the print and why can't traditional 3D printers with relevant filaments achieve the qualities uh, exhibited by other types of prints? Okay, I, I think, it, it, well, chemistry is the, is the, the really simple one word answer. Um, I'm taking a step further. It's the difference between thermosetting polymers and thermoplastics. So if you consider shape memory changing metals, um, titanium, hasn't got a shape memory function. Nickel hasn't got a shape memory function. You pick an alloy of titanium and nickel and make nitinol, you have a shape memory because those two materials react differently to temperature. Now, if you take a traditional thermoplastic like TPU, it's just thermoplastic polyurethane. It, it's a single constituent polymer. What, what we do with, with 4D biomaterials, our, our, our materials are a thermoset and they're a blend of polycarbonate and polyurethane. And those two materials as thermosets have different thermal uh, properties. So I can take a piece of, of material that's 4D printed. I can compress it, put it in cold water, and it will stay in the shape in cold water until I put it back into body temperature, and it will go back to its original shape. The difference with, with TPU is if I do that, if I cool it down, it will just stay there. Uh, there'll be no response. So it's, it's, it's all down to chemistry. Um, but thermoplastic materials don't really have a shape memory capability. You need, you need thermosets or metals. Okay, great, thanks. Hey, um, I, I want to ask everyone here, uh, this, I've never heard of this term 4D print, so. Okay, um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of, yeah, it's, I, I mean, we all live in 4D. Um, well, that's not, yes, that is true, actually. The only people who are in 3D are people who've died. Um, so, you know, we all live with time. Time is the fourth dimension around us. So 4D refers to three-dimensional components that have another axis of, um, of use, if you like. So that could be shape memory change. It could be a change in electrical or thermal property over time uh, or a change in mass. So it's, it's, using, it's using layer by layer manufacturing, but not just using it to make geometry. It's using it to also embed function as well. So in the case of the work that we do, it's making resorbable polymers that when you put them in the human body over the space of eight weeks, 12 weeks, three years, they disappear and they're designed to disappear. That's the fourth dimension. Gotcha. Thank you. Thanks. Um, it's, there's Thanks. only a couple of minutes left on the panel here. Um, so I want to just ask one last question for each of you, which is <coughs> to do with the fact that, <coughs> pardon me, um, there's a lot of students in the audience here and interns masters and graduate students what would you advise them if they were interested in getting into working where you guys work in, in the industry that you work in and the career that you have 
what's your advice to them? Um, and we'll go in the order that we introduced ourselves at the start. So um, Philip, do you want to go first? Yeah, uh, I would, if you want to get into 3D printing and you've got a 3D printer at home, um, put it in a box and put it in the bottom of your wardrobe and then go and understand what 3D printing is in industry because it's a re really, really very different thing. Um, and go to some trade shows and look at industrial 3D printers and how they're deployed and applied in industry um, because they're, they're not seen as wonderful gleaming salvations. They're just seen as machine tools. Um, and understanding that and understanding how they add value is the most important thing. So yeah, understand about industrial 3D printing technology and understand about the economics of why people use it. Uh, thanks, Phil. Um, SK, uh, do you have advice on um, where people should be going if they want to, to follow your footsteps as it were? Well, 3D printing or additive manufacturing is a multidisciplinary field. Uh, it's uh, it's a manufacturing process enabled by digital. If there won't, if we wouldn't have had, you know, digit being able to digitize and such fast processors and so much ability on the digital side, we would not have had 3D printing possible. It's only possible because of that. Now, but then with 3D printing, there are different processes, different materials, uh, different things associated with it. So. So there's a lot of opportunity. If you are interested in engineering, then you will find a niche within 3D printing, which where you fit in, right? Uh, be it computer engineering, computer science, or, uh, or it is mechanical engineering, uh, materials engineering, uh, and, and material science. And, and you can fit at different levels as well. Like you can be a, a technical person operating the machine, or you could be a scientist understanding what's going on. Um, so there, there's a lot of opportunity in 3D printing. So yeah, I would definitely encourage people to do that. Um, but it's very interdisciplinary. If you are just interested in mechanical engineering aspect and designing stuff, and you do not enjoy talking about how materials, different materials and different things can affect that, then it's not your space. Because, and I think, I think if you are in, if you are if you want to do something, but you're also interested in different aspects as an engineering, then this is this is your space, uh, and you should follow that. And and the beauty of 3D printing is you can get in 3D, you know, get, understand the industry, get get into the industry, and you can find a find the right fit for you uh, over time. Even if you started, like let's say you start as a mechanical engineer, and I've seen some mechanical engineers moving more towards understanding materials aspect and then materials engineers going understanding towards mechanical aspects. And a person like me, I'm a materials background, but always involved with predictive analysis, right? I always like that intersection. And here I'm doing in a way predictive, but more detection of issues, but you know, involving artificial intelligence and machine learning. And then uh, overall in the long term will involve physics-based modeling as well. So. So when we hire people in our company, we, their excitement to, for interdisciplinary things is very important. Um, so yeah. Great, thank you so much. Um, and finally, Thomas, uh, what, how, what would you advise uh, students to do if they were interested in following you into the, the legal side of things when it comes to uh, manufacturing and, and cybersecurity? Yeah, uh, I will <laughs> recommend them to, to work either for Phil or SK, I guess they will do uh, more, <laughs> more work on 3D printing than I'm doing, uh, because as you may know, in a law firm, you don't really choose your clients. I mean, you might get new clients that are doing 3D printing, but it's, a, as uh, SK mentioned, a, a small world. Uh, so if you really want to do a full-time uh, job on 3D printing stuff, uh, you should better work with SK or, or Philip. Um, but um, yeah, otherwise, being a, in a law firm, you have a chance to do work on the you know, cybersecurity, um, AI, and, and well, anything that's related to new tech. Uh, so that makes us, us the job very pleasant and challenging too. Um, but yeah, so my advice would be to choose exactly what you, you want. Uh, In-house, it's going to be more targeted to the sector. Whereas if you go in a law firm, it will be uh, obviously a broader job. But yes, both options are, are fine to me. Great. Thank you so much. Well, I'd just like to thank um, Philip, uh, uh, SK and Thomas again for joining us today.
Uh, thanks again to the audience for coming and joining. Obviously, if we had no audience, these wouldn't be much fun at all. Um, and uh, thanks again to our sponsors, the National Science Foundation and the NYU Center for Cybersecurity for hosting this event. Um, this uh, recording of this will be put onto YouTube uh, and we'll um, share that with uh, everyone. And um, yeah, so, so thanks again for joining and that concludes uh, this today's webinar. Yeah. Thank you everyone. Thanks, that was great. Thanks everyone. Right. Thank you very Bye. much. Bye-bye.